Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ideas validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Are you aware of your healing powers? Do you instinctively place your hand on the area of your body that hurts? Why? Why would you do that? Have you ever sent a heartfelt, get well soon, I'm wishing you a speedy recovery, a message to a sick friend, and soon after you heard back from them that they started feeling much better? Did you connect the dots? The ability to heal both ourselves and others is the divine gift we were given as co-creators of our life and this reality. It is intrinsic to our biological and ethereal being. To heal means to bring back the living organism to its inherent state of equilibrium, whatever it is for the individual being. Now more than ever, we need to rediscover, learn and teach the power of healing we all have, no exception. We need to awaken the healer within. Now, please note that I am not suggesting for one moment that when you are injured or fell ill, that you don't seek medical attention and simply try to get better. Absolutely, please. You always need to seek medical help, and after you have received it, you can consciously participate in the healing process to practice your self-healing skills. To discuss this topic, I have invited back to my show Wendy Coulter. Wendy is a certified medical intuitive, certified wellness coach, and founder and CEO of The Practical Path, Inc. She is president of National Organization for Medical Intuition and the author of the groundbreaking book Essentials of Medical Intuition, A Visionary Path to Wellness. You will find more information about Wendy in her guest bio on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. My first interview with Wendy was back in Season 4, titled Medical Intuition, A New Paradigm for Healthcare. If by any chance you've missed it, I would encourage you to listen to it as well, as we are taking that conversation to the next level. Hello, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining me. It's so great to have you back on my show. How are you? Oh, so nice to see you, Anna. Thank you so much for inviting me back. So what's new with you? Are you still doing your research and studies with IONS? Yes, that's right. We did talk about that. It was in the planning stages. And right now uh, we are in the getting it off the ground stages, which I'm very excited to announce. Uh, The study was funded and approved Uh, So we're ready to roll and we're going to have medical doctors, their patients and a medical intuitive all together and see what happens there. And uh, what we're what we're looking for. Yeah, what we're testing is or what we're studying, I should say, is what the medical doctors think about working with a medical intuitive. We're excited about that. Very, very exciting. Thank you for sharing. You know, I've been getting information downloads from the universal mind since my early childhood. I had vivid memories of my past lives. I was psychically wide open. But of course, I started shutting down as I felt I was very different from other children and even adults. But I still remember quite a lot from those information downloads. I'd like to use one such example as a springboard to this conversation. When I was about probably six years old, I was given my first lesson about all people being connected at the energy level in the quantum field. 
and all coming from one source in a very simple way. I was shown a hand in my mind and was told that people and souls are like fingers, all separate and individual, and yet all connected and growing from one hand. And that when we come into the physical world, we are not really those fingers per se, but the essence inside the fingers that moves them and gives them life. The skin on the fingers, using this metaphor, I understood to be the membrane separating the spirit from the physical world. And this made perfect sense to me, but when I tried to explain this to my parents, <laughs> well, you can imagine what was their reaction. So let's start with the premise that we are all connected at the energy level in the quantum field, and that separation is an illusion, just like the fingers believe that they are all separate and different as they forgot that they are connected to the same palm, and also that one finger can't really do much alone. It usually needs help from the other fingers. So could you please speak to this premise, which is by now a well-documented scientific fact, and its consequences for us from the scientific and perhaps esoteric points of view? What a lovely analogy that we're fingers of a hand and the hand itself. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I love that, Anna. I love it. I still remember it. <laughs> <laughs> Such a great uh, visual on it, actually. Um, you know, I myself have had, and I think many people who consider themselves spiritual may have also had similar kinds of experiences where you have kind of in a, in a wake-up moment, in a way, um, this understanding that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience, not the other way around, you know. And for me, that happened when I was about 17. <laughs> and I was in a group of people and um, uh, we were doing some really fun kind of interesting exercises. There was no drugs involved. I'll just say that right up front. <laughs> I was very aware <laughs> of cognizant state. We were not out of body, none of that. But I had this it's interesting experience of everybody being connected by this golden grid and uh, that we really were, um, all humanity was uh, kind of connected to this greater consciousness and that we all had access to. And that was a real profound mm. moment for me. I would say a peak experience, you would say. And I, I you know, I was always a spiritual kid like you, an intuitive kid. But as I got older, you know, there's plenty of things in life that move you away from that. And that was kind of a wake up for me to remember in a way, you know, this really is true. This idea of we are one, what does that mean? It's such a nice, lovely thing to say, but what does it really mean? And it was only later when I started sort of reading about quantum field and cosmic consciousness and all the rest of that groovy stuff. And of course, became a professional intuitive and then a medical intuitive. I understood that when we tap into, you could say this one consciousness or this quantum field or this all that is, or however you want to language it, you know, um, we really do have access and that access isn't just for some lucky folks, you know, some special people. It's really for everybody if you choose to cultivate that. Yes, absolutely. You know, I feel that one of the key challenges or our key challenges on the physical plane is to reconnect with our own healing power and understand that we can heal ourselves and heal others. Could you please explain briefly how energy healing works so that everyone could understand and <laughs> what are the requisites is it intention love anything else what are the necessary ingredients for this to happen you know as a medical intuitive i don't actually do energy healings that's a separate skill set in my world what i mean by that is Medical intuition is a skill set of observation and assessment. So I'm still tapping into that quantum consciousness, so to speak, um, that higher self point of view, you could say. And from that experience, I'm observing and assessing the physical body and the biofield. Now, that can be very healing when people hear what they're 
bodies have to say or what their, their chakra system, you know, wants them to know or what their higher self's perspective on this or that issue is, that is, can be quite healing, but the intention is not to heal. The intention is informational. So my client hears things. Now I used to do energy healing. I still do. Sometimes I'm a, a certified energy healer as well. And in the energy healing space, that was about working with the client's biofield and physical body to essentially remove or shift whatever could be removed or shifted in their energy field. And the intention, no matter what the practice is, is always with the highest good of the client and the highest good of the energy involved, but also ethics come into play and other things. Uh, that we as human beings have to be aware of. Um, But I'll tell you a little story, if I might, that I think um, kind of outlines my own perspective on your wonderful question. And the difference, I think, between medical intuition and energy healing. When I was in energy healing, doing energy healings a lot, I used to notice that sometimes a client would come into my office and be ready, very ready to let a lot of stuff go. And so I would do my practice and I'd use my hands and energy and things like that. And they could let a lot of things go and they'd leave the office, you know, leave my session feeling much lighter and much more healed. Uh, And there were some clients at some points that had trouble with that would have trouble letting things go. And no matter how much energy healing I did on something, uh, it was still a challenge for them. So as an energy healer and as an intuitive person, I was very adept at using visual intuition because I had a good experience of that healing myself at a younger point. I learned how to use visual uh, skills to heal, right? Like guided imagery and things. So I found myself being able to see right into their bodies and their life history on where and where a physical issue originated. And sometimes it was emotional and sometimes it was physical. It was always a combination of the two, put it that way. And as I observed that, I would have these powerful hits, you know, and a lot of inflama- information flooding in. And I remember saying to one of my clients, how about if I don't give you a healing just now, but I just look and see what I can see and tell you what I see. Ah. And I thought, well, maybe that could help. <laughs> and so I tried that on a client and uh, I'll never forget, you know, there was the information that their body was holding and their biofield, their chakra system and their auric field was holding about the origins of this stuck energy was so profound and so powerful for them that at the end of that hour, they looked at me and they said, I think I need to go and think about all this for a while. <laughs> and uh, they did. And when they came back, when I gave them a healing, they were letting go of things that they'd been holding on to for decades. So I noticed that this process of assessment and observation and information could even be more powerful for a client when something was stuck or not moving or even just as a beginning, a foundational skill to use. And so when I moved on in my energy healing practice, I always did an assessment first. And then I realized, you know what this is? This is medical intuition. There's actually a skill set for this that people talk about. And then, of course, doctors were calling me to look at their patients. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, the experience grew from there. But that is a different perspective from energy healing than it is from medical intuition. And I want to make that distinction because I think it's important. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Now, I titled this episode, The Healer Within, as I believe that the healing process begins and ends with us. There are many healers and healing agents in our world. Nature is a healer, Mother Earth is a healer, the moon, the sun, and various planets have certain healing powers if you want to extend to this level. But only we can allow or disallow the healing, either consciously or unconsciously. So would you agree with my position that we need to turn inside and awaken our healing powers 
before turning to any external agents. Without question, I would agree with you. And I even have my own life uh, experience to back that up. Um, years ago, I was diagnosed with a little tumor. And uh, I had been reading a bunch of books about guided imagery and healing with guided meditations. Uh, one of those books was Deepak Chopra's book called Quantum Healing, where he talked about um, how he would train his patients to use their own healer within to heal their issues. And a lot of it was used, uh, how he did it was with guided visualization. And I love that. To me, that was like so cool because, you know, the idea of visual intuition and the idea of using it on oneself is so potent, right? So uh, I remember that the doctor diagnosed this little growth as a benign tumor. And I said to the doctor, hey, I've just been reading this great book by Deepak Chopra where he's teaching people how to heal themselves with their minds. <laughs> do you mind if I try it? And the doctor <laughs> looked at me because what she wanted to do was she wanted to have surgery. She wanted to remove it surgically just to be on the safe side. It wasn't cancerous or anything, but she said, let's just take it out. And I said, okay. And she said, well, we'll set the date for two weeks ahead. And that was when I said, hey, do you mind if I try just using my mind to get rid of the tumor? <laughs> And, you know, she, I'll never forget, Anna. She looked at me like, you know how a dog turns its head and kind of looks at you with a question yeah. mark? That's how she looked at me like, what are you talking about? And she said, well, I guess it couldn't hurt. <laughs> and, you know, True. set me on my yeah. way. And uh -huh. what I did in those two weeks changed my life. I, every day, um, and I was doing a meditation practice at the time, but I used this it, as well as the meditation. In my meditation practice, I started visualizing that little growth shrinking. And I used a funny image of a happy little scrub brush and little happy scrubbing bubbles, right? Little scrubbers, right? Uh -huh. And I just imagine those, they're giggling and laughing and they're, they're, just, they're just dissolving it away. And uh, it was a really fun and silly image, but I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to do this, it better be fun, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't pay any attention to it for those two weeks other than that. Every day for about five minutes, I just imagine the little bubbles just dissolving it away. Well, two weeks go by. Did you feel anything? No, I, no, I didn't feel anything. I mean, I felt joyful when I did it. <laughs> okay. Because it yeah. was a really fun image. And I thought, ooh, this is cool. <laughs> uh, you know, what can I say? And so two weeks later, um, I'm in the pre-op. And uh, the doctor comes to give me an examination. And the tumor was someplace I couldn't obviously easily see on my own. So I won't tell you where it was. But <laughs> I heard her gasp. And I thought, oh, my goodness, that's it. Curtains for Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, what did you do? Uh, the tumor had or the little growth had shrunk from about the size of a nickel to the size of a pea. Uh -huh. And it wasn't that kind of growth. It wasn't just going to automatically shrink on its own. And I told her, I said, I told you I was going to do these visualization exercises. And she gave me that look again. You know, <laughs> it's like, what? Anyway, we had the surgery. It was successful. I also used it in the healing process, kind of, you know, seeing the scar sort of come together, the, the, the skin, you know, <laughs> heal and, you know, the incision heal and, and no scar tissue. And that's exactly what happened. And um, after that whole experience, when I went back for the follow-up appointment, I gave her a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what. I hope she has read it. I don't know. You know, I don't remember. <laughs> But that was many years ago, but it changed my understanding of our mind's ability to affect the body in a positive way and in a negative way. Yes. You know, what could, led up to that, what created that and how to heal it. It just shifted my world entirely. And that's when I started looking into energy healing because I'm like, there's something here that bears exploration into the, this idea of mind-body connection. What is that? Absolutely. Well, you know, there you go. And I love, love teaching people how to use their minds to heal their bodies because it's absolutely a skill we can all utilize and the body loves it. Yes. Yes. Thank you for sharing. I love this story. <laughs> and also you have touched upon a very important point, which is a lovely segue to my next question. The influence of our mind on our body 
is a two-way street in a sense of both positive and negative thoughts and intentions and emotions and visualizations. So my question is, how important is for our emotional state for the healing to occur? So still looking at, at the positive side, but as we know, our psychology governs our physiology. Yep. And this is a scientific fact. And the stress hormones, for example, are the best illustration of that because this is well documented and evidenced. And how we get stress hormones when we get stressed out, how we get stressed out when we have certain thoughts that lead to certain negative mm -hmm. emotions that then create stress hormones in a nutshell. So could you please speak to this for a moment? Because this is, I think, a, a an aspect of healing that often escapes people when they say, oh, okay, so it's only when I think positively, this will be the outcome. But then, you know, the next moment they will curse their the body that doesn't look the way they want it or doesn't work the way they, they want it to. And so this also has a <laughs> quite significant effect on, on their body. Without question, Anna, without question. Um, this is the work I do uh, when I look at people's bodies is where is the origin of this? What is, the, where is the traumatic incident of the, of life? Uh, what is the mind doing? There, there's a field of, of actually of education and study. It's called psychoneuroimmunology. And you might know about that. It's a wonderful field where they study the connection between our stress, our emotions and our immune system and nervous system. And wow, is there the connections there are, they go back to, you know, birth and before. And when we allow our lives to be ruled by stress and negative emotions. And for, for many people, when there's early life trauma, it's very hidden in later life. It just, you know, you work through it, you, you think about it, you go through therapy through it or whatever, but energetically, this stuff can stick. Um, and man, I tell my students, if I had a dollar for every client I've seen who who says, well, I've worked all through all that. I dealt with all my childhood trauma. And I'm like, well, energetically, it's still here in the liver or the kidneys or whatever. So what can we do to shift the energy of it, even though emotionally or mentally or psychologically you've worked through it? Why isn't it leaving? You know, there's an energy that's sticky. So this is this is a missing piece in healthcare. <laughs> it's a missing piece in certainly in conventional medicine or, or mainstream or even integrative medicine. Yes. And you know, it's like we've had like what 30 years of the idea of mind body and and it still hasn't permeated healthcare, which is one of the reasons why this study we're so excited about because the medical intuitives will be looking at all this including the physical. So, you know, Speaking from my own experience as a practitioner and certainly my own experience as a human, uh, when we have unresolved emo negative uh, emotions and th the stress that comes with it, it has a profound effect on the body. And that's one of those things that we, in our busy lives, you know, we overlook. And everybody talks about self care, but, you know, you got to practice it. <laughs> But most people don't really understand. That's why I wanted to invite you back to my show to talk again about it and yeah. perhaps take it to the higher level because this is a message that needs to be reiterated yes. so that it is on people's radar. And also on top of that, what most people probably don't realize is that whenever we recall a traumatic event, which we thought, you know, we had dealt with and we forgot about it. Whenever, every single time we recall it, we are actually and literally bring up the same emotions, the same stress hormones. So we are literally reliving at the emotional level, at the energy level, that traumatic event, whether it was physical event, emotional event, or any other. And that, if you like, reactivates that and that negative energy in the part of the body that it's sitting which leads to again so-called chronic stress which most people don't really understand what it means it means that your your body is constantly bombarded with those same 
hormones, those same emotions, those same memories, and it just never ends until this is removed and and cleaned and cleared and dealt with. I so agree. Um, there are ways, and I teach ways for people to neutralize, which is a really good word for this, neutralize stuck mm -hmm. energies that are chronic in nature. That's the right word for it is just the more you dwell, dwell, dwell. It, there's a, you know, I have a bone to pick with some of the spiritual folks that I love and know. And that is, you know, we're just not going to deal with the negative. We're just going to go for the affirmations. <laughs> we're going to think positive thoughts all the time. And we're not going to think anything negative. And although that is beautiful and admirable, it's not really the way humans are wired. <laughs> and it's not enough. It is not enough. It's simply not enough. Yes. Not enough. No, yeah. because the energy is still there. Yeah. The energy of the traumatic, whatever, the negative emotion or the negative experience can still hold until you clean that out. Now, that's where I think energy healing is brilliant because the energy healer can discern where those imbalances are and start to clean them out. And if you're ready to let them go, you can, but sometimes they have to come up to awareness before you can even think to let them go. And something else I wanted to mention earlier, the body, not just the mind, but the physical body has its own consciousness. Our, our livers, our kidneys, our skin cells, our, the cells of our body have their own consciousness. And that means that they may be holding on to things that we in our conscious awareness aren't even aware of. And so we want to be stewards of our own mind and bodies and energy systems. So to circle back um, I teach a, a workshop that I hope everybody would be you know, interested in, and that is uh, medical intuition for self-healing. And what does that mean? That means we are going to start querying our bodies in terms of asking them, what do you need? What do you need me to know? And what do you need? What questions? Nobody asks those questions. <laughs> We go to healer and, and practitioner and the other, and we get done to, and we get, you know, all of the treatments and we do whatever, but when do we ever talk to our own bodies? When do we ever ask our body, what do you want? What do you need? What are you holding on to that you'd like to let go? That in a nutshell, I believe is the, the biggest value of medical intuition, whether somebody uses it for their own self-healing or as a professional with others, it's the same process of querying and listening and being present for the answer. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned a couple of courses or a couple of educational material that you have available. One is this workshop. Yeah. And you mentioned that you also teach people how to neutralize those remaining negative energy clusters, if you like, in your body. Yeah. Is the first technique included in that workshop or are they two separate courses? How, how do you teach them? The, well, there's two options for people. One on the website, thepracticalpath.com, there uh, is a tab for services and under that is guided meditation. And what I put there, and it's free for everyone, and I encourage everyone to listen, are some very important, what I call foundational techniques. Now they're called the energy essentials techniques for grounding, shielding, and releasing. And that's, I mean, I think everybody can benefit from that. And I have so many clients and people who listen to my, you know, read my book or, or listen to podcasts, they go right there and I get lots of great feedback on them. It's free to everybody. Grounding technique, shielding technique, and releasing technique. Those are neutralizers, energy neutralizers. Now, in the workshop, which is also available on the website, it's a self-study program. Uh, it's called Medical Intuition for Healing and Self-Care. And we go even deeper into the process of learning how to communicate with your own body, how to visualize it, how to listen to it. And those techniques are expanded on in the workshop. So it's a treasure trove, just really a treasure trove uh, for people who really want to learn how to do this and use their intuition. Thank you. Yes. And I will include all the links in the show notes so that people can find it. Lovely. 
In my recent interview with Cynthia Larson, The Quantum Age, we talked about retrocausality, which means changing the past with current or future intentions, which Cynthia believes we can use especially in healing. Retrocausality has been scientifically proven at the subatomic level, mind you, in the lab, so far in a lab experiment, using the quantum principle of entanglement. It essentially says that two linked particles are always connected regardless of the physical distance between them, and any impact on one is instantaneously felt and reflected on the other. Anyway, this is a significant stretch for our linear mind, but if we accept that anything is possible in quantum reality, then we can accept that we can change the past. A simple example would be in the healing arena. Say if someone broke their leg and an x-ray were taken in hospital uh, and then during the recovery, the person decided to change the past with their intention for the bone to be perfectly healthy and never broken. The bone heals quickly, but then the doctor checks the initial x-rays on which the leg was not broken at all. So they were not the new x-rays, the, the initial x-rays, which is at odds with the clinical notes by the radiologist and the doctor, confirming and describing the bone fracture. <laughs> and I've heard of such examples of such case studies. So that person has definitely changed their past history of their injured leg, which healed the fracture as it has never existed. And to add more spice to it, in my mind, the question remains whether they changed the past or quantum jumped to a parallel reality, you know, the Mandela effect, in which they never broke their leg to begin with. <laughs> and I didn't discuss this, this last point with Cynthia. So, Wendy, what are your thoughts on retrocausality in the context of healing? <laughs> That's such a great question, Anna. You know, uh, in many ways, that's like above my pay grade, to be honest, because, but, but I will say this, it's really, it's really a fun thing to think about, yeah. isn't it? Just please speculate. Yes, I'll speculate away. I'll tell you where I have seen something like that. There was a period of time where, when I was doing a lot of readings and sessions, and I was kind of asking my own connection to quantum energy, my own connection to, you know, my guidance. Can you tell me a little about this? What would happen if someone really was able to heal in their present life, the epigenetic trauma that came down the family line, right? Uh, you know about epigenetics? I can explain it briefly. Yeah. Yep. For the audience. Epigenetics refers to uh, traumatic energy or traumatic uh, traumas that have passed down through generations to the current generation. And there's a lot of research on this that and are in your genes, yes, in, in your, your in your in your genes, in yeah. your DNA. Yeah. And that that DNA is expressed in certain ways in some people in different ways in others. And if there is trauma in the family line, it might be expressed in, you know, three generations forward uh, from an early, you know, a, a generational trauma. So I have seen that from my perspective in medical intuition. And what I have been wondering is if the current generation actually energetically heals that trauma, that epigenetic genetic trauma, could that heal retroactively and also forward? Forward, yes, we know it would heal. But what? A, what why couldn't you heal backwards as well? I don't know. You might not be able to change the circumstances of your great-grandparents, <laughs> you know, whatever. But could you heal the family line backwards and forwards? That is such a cool question. I don't really have an answer for that because I'm not a quantum theorist, but energetically, I think it's probably possible. Why not? If we're all connected, if all things are connected, and if space-time reality is a, a human linear construct, why not? I just, <laughs> I just got an insight from my guidance <laughs> to go all the way out on a limb here. Okay, alongside of mm -hmm. what you have just shared, there would possibly be one scenario in which we might be able to test it 
because obviously we can't go into into the past, okay, to our ancestors' lives. But there is a window, there is an opening <laughs> here, and that is, let's say, we have done some ancestral epigenetic healing on a particular traumatic event, and through a psychic medium, we contact our ancestors, so our grand, great great grandfather or whoever in our family line lineage and ask them about it and if they say well you know actually this never happened <laughs> we have healed the past that's such a great thought <laughs> really you should get some mediums on and practice that seriously i think that's such a lovely idea <laughs> there would possibly be one potentially would be you know might be interested uh, Mark Anthony, mm -hmm. who also was on my show twice, yeah. he's very open-minded, and in fact, he works with a number of of uh, university researchers on developing devices that can facilitate communication with the other side. And this is quite a serious uh, scientific project with very prominent researchers involved in it. So uh, maybe he <laughs> he might be interested, but as a concept, as an idea, I mean. Why not? I Listen, you know, my philosophy <laughs> of, of all of this now is everything <laughs> and anything is possible. Seriously. Yes. When you work with energy and intuition and the quantum field and tapping in and, you know, all of that, there's really no limits on it. And that's that's really fun. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this. I do, and, and this is really typical of medical intuitive, we see connections and uh, possibilities that may not actually have even manifested yet. So if we're seeing something that hasn't manifested yet, you could imagine the reverse might be true. Uh, and so, I, you know, look, <laughs> I've been working with the Institute of Noetic Sciences. This is their, this is, they love this. This is their whole thing. And, um, you know, their ideas about it are just sort of mind, mind blowing. You know, and still here we are paying the bills and buying groceries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when we're multidimensional pan yes. time and space beings. <laughs> I was laughing when I was quoting that example with a broken leg because to an extent it is in the same vein of your personal example with one key difference that your new x-rays showed a difference in the tumor. While in my example, the old x-rays when they were retrieved, there was no fracture. It wasn't there. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. You know, I mean, if that can be bottled and sold and proven, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> replicated. <laughs> yeah. And who knows? It's very possible. Why not? You know, I mean, why not? There's a lot of a lot of philosophers and, and spiritual folks out there who would agree absolutely and might even have their own stories of that. I can tell you from my perspective, though, you're making me think about past lives, which is not the ancestral line. It's the spiritual line, right? Incarnating again and again with similar people in similar circumstances for, for karmic reasons. Can we heal the past through our experience of past lives, which is really interesting to me because I like looking at them. Um, and my feeling about that is yes. <laughs> if we can heal, if we can understand the karmic connections, which also has to do with that multidimensional mandala effect, really from a different perspective, I suppose. But when we're talking about timelines, why are we not talking about past life timelines as well? Past life is, is only a perspective in the present. It's really concurrent lives, you could, right? So if we have concurrent lives and lifetimes and strings, you know, with all the different people in our, in our experience and new ones and as well, what is it we're here to learn? And I think all of this boils down, other than a really wonderful scientific experiment perspective, I think it all boils down to our life lessons, our karmic experiences, um, what we are in this little brief period of time that we're humans in this body, you know, doing this, you know, for lucky it's a hundred years, usually, you know, whatever. Um, but that's still in the millennia of time. That's like a, a blip, right? So while we're here enjoying this life, 
what is it we're here to learn, to assimilate, to move our soul's path forward in this life and future lives and past lives that are all concurrent, even in the life that we're living where we can tap into this more um, con- this concept of, of string theory and quantum theory and affecting our every moment. You know, it's just fascinating to delve into this and, and let your mind play with it. And there are no boundaries. We can imagine whatever we want to imagine, knowing that it already exists in the quantum field, because everything that has been thought of is imagined or can be imagined already exists in the quantum field. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing in the whole of the creation that exists outside of it in a thought form or energy form. So so we are one in all this big soup. (laughs) You know, I'll share with you this. Cosmic soup. Yeah, that's right. The cosmic soup and cosmic soup. And I'll tell you this, as a medical intuitive, I always feel like the world is catching up, right? So, well, certainly science. Uh, yeah. Science is like way behind, right? Not not quantum field science, but, you know, medical science and whatnot. <laughs> I mean, they're just like the, the intuitives are out in front. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, everybody else is like catching up. It always cracks me up when I see a research report, you know, in, in, you know, some medical journal that outlines this new idea that as a medical intuitive, I've been seeing for 10, 15 (laughs) years. I'm like, I knew about that, you know, and now you're proving it, right? So the intuitives always have this weird experience of like, well, finally they're catching up. (laughs) Which is okay. I mean, <laughs> we can give them a bit of uh, leeway and a bit of credit for the hard work. But yes, I agree with you that this process of catching up should be really escalated because it takes too long. It takes too long. And, and we, we, know, we know more. So I'll give you this. Um, uh, Julia Moshbridge, who is a wonderful scientist. I don't know if you've, you've spoken with her. She's delightful. Uh, she wrote a wonderful book about precognizance, which is about, you know, seeing a potential future. And I heard her speak about it at one of the IONS conferences, the Institute of Noetic Science conferences. And she was up there saying, look, you know, quote, intuition, unquote, you know, connection to universal source, connection to quantum field, all of those ways of saying it. She said, why aren't we putting this to work? (laughs) Which of course I was like raising my hand going, yes, 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 yes. But, uh, you know, she said, well, why don't we have intuitives in business? Why don't we have intuitives in healthcare? Why don't we have intuitives out there in the world in research, you know, pushing things forward because the connection to non-local consciousness, which is another way to say it, um, meaning, you know, that quantum field, that because it contains anything and everything, why aren't we utilizing it now? I thought that was such a brilliant perspective. Absolutely. But you know what stands in the way? And we talked about it in our uh, previous conversation, people's egos. (laughs) (laughs) So if you went to a, a large company, and spoke with the CEO and, and said to them, the way you are running the company is really not taking it into the right direction. I can tell you, I can offer you some suggestions because I can see this, 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 and the other. Now, some people admittedly might say, okay, great, you know, give me the info and I'll pay you for, for it. Take advantage <laughs> of your skills. But then there are those, and in, especially in the scientific circles, well, yes. who would feel, well, how can you tell me what I don't know, while I have all this knowledge and experience, etc., and you don't. So I think this is the main bridge that perhaps we need to cross for people to just say, okay, forget about your pride, forget about your ego, think about your future and how much more you can achieve and build and improve and change with the help of an intuitive who can actually tell you what's coming up. Now, obviously, that's a broader conversation and longer conversation in itself because there need to be, you know, certain guidelines and ethics and boundaries and qualifiers, etc. So I'm not going there. But as a principle, as an idea, absolutely. Absolutely. And 
speaking about past lives and concurrent lives. As a medical intuitive, do you work with astrology, especially evolutionary astrology, which goes into the past lives or other lifetimes of the person that they are reading for? Yes. As a medical intuitive, I work with past lives. And my perspective on past lives is how is it impacting the current life? A lot of people kind of just go and play in the past life arena. My perspective is I want to know what's going on for my client currently and what the past life information is for them so that they can utilize it in this present life. It's in, it's all informational for our, our, our soul's growth, right? So that's how I, I work with it. And I teach that as well in my programs. But do you work with astrology as such? Oh, you asked about astrology. I do not. Okay. That's not within my wheelhouse. I love it. I love evolutionary astrology. I think it's a very important piece of, of the of information, you know, to see what's going on. And personally, I, I adore astrology. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a few astrologers, a couple of astrologers on my show, Stephen Forrest and Diana Doe. So I can recommend those episodes as well. Mm -hmm. How can we all wake up to and remember our healing powers. Would you be able to share with us just one or two quick and easy techniques, perhaps, that people can do at home <laughs> as the first step towards recognizing and reconnecting with their own healing powers? Absolutely. And these are these are going to be more general suggestions because because Every, sure. Everybody will find what works best for them if that's their goal. And not everything is going to work for everyone. That's also important. We're all very different, right, in that regard. So what I say to people is find a meditation practice that you love, right? Meditation, when you're a busy person, seems like, oh, God, another thing to do, right? Uh, if you can't do sit down and do a five-minute meditation practice, then do a few minutes of breathing before you get out of bed in the morning and then at night before you go to sleep. And what that means is just connecting to the body, taking these beautiful deep breaths from as far down as you can in the diaphragm area, deep breaths in and out, just slowly, gently, don't make yourself dizzy, <laughs> and ask your mind to sort of do a quick check-in with your physical body. How's my stomach feeling? How's my chest feeling? How are my shoulders feeling? And see if you can't breathe into those areas and just relax the body. Bodies love this. And it's our minds that, you know, are twirling, right? And they don't let it slow down. Our vagus nerve, our nervous system loves this. Uh, meditation is sometimes more than a big bite, bigger bite than your average person might want to take. But Meditation practices are also wonderful because they'll combine things like breathing and grounding and all the rest of that. Um, but even just simple, Dr. Andrew Weil has something called, I think, four, seven, eight breathing, where you breathe in for four counts, you hold for seven counts, you breathe out for eight counts, and that automatically calms the vagus nerve. But if you add to it, okay, I'm just going to do some gentle breathing here, body, how are you feeling? How are my toes feeling? How are my knees feeling? You know, And just breathe into those spots. It really can just help calm everything down. And people think it's just such a silly throwaway thing. But I got to tell you, that is, that is the mind-body connection, using your mind uh. <laughs> to influence and, and check in, you know? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. I'm loving this. I'm loving this technique. And it, it is beautiful. And really, our body loves when we are paying attention to it. Yes. Because we are not paying attention to it, our physical yeah, body, that yeah. is. Because we are living in our head and we are not paying attention to it, at some point it will, you know, we're getting aches and pains and here and there, which the body says, hey, pay attention. Pay attention to what you're eating, you know, when you get stomachache. Pay attention to, you know, how much rest you get or your exercise when you, you know, sprain your, your ankle. So our body loves when we're paying attention to it. So when we can do this scan of all the parts of our body while breathing in this beautiful way, relaxing way, I mean, it's a win, 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 win scenario. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll also give you this. 
Our, it very much is. Our bodies, if you think about it, are like little children. They really are. And they have their own awareness. They have their own consciousness. They can communicate. But a lot of the time, because they hold things, they're going to hold things for a long time. So if you think about your body as a child that you want to nurture and come and take care of, and not necessarily with ice cream <laughs> all the time, <laughs> but with but with care, with attention, as you say, a focused attention and and calming words, like how would you calm a child if they were upset? That's really what bodies love. Uh, I agree with you on this. Absolutely on it. It's, it's, you know, to me, that is ultimate self-care. We can go and have a massage and what are we doing? We're soothing the inner child. Yes, massage or or have a infrared sauna, uh, which I'm going to have mine next week. <laughs> Good for you. Yes. Yeah, so any techniques and any practices and interventions that help our physical body are just brilliant and I and our body loves it. They just love it. Now. And I actually talk to my body as if it was a little child and I say it's gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be fine. We'll be okay. I'm right here with you, body. <laughs> yes. Oh I'm loving it. <laughs> Wendy, my final question, because time is catching up with us, unfortunately, because we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> I'd like to extrapolate the energy healing concept from healing ourselves to healing others to healing the world, which is so critical, especially now, as we all know. What would be your final thought on the untapped potential of healing that we all have? I love the question. Um, healing the planet um, the planet is a body, just like us. It has lungs, it has flow, it has, you know, rivers and tributaries, just like we have blood flow. It has skin, the crust of the earth, it's the skin. If you think about the planet as a living, breathing body, you could say, then what does that need? Just as we take care of our own bodies, what is the planet asking for? You know, We've seen so much anger and uh, drama and trauma in the you know the human experience that the, the Earth, in my from my view, is also experiencing it along with us. Well, what what does not only we talk a lot about what we need personally for our own body, mind, and spirit connection. Well, what does the planet need? So when I do my when I do my meditations, I like to expand it out beyond my own physical body and expand that energy out to cover the whole planet to you know heal and and soothe uh, the best I can. And you know there's been a lot of research about that uh, energetic connection when people do that, that it actually does have an effect resonance. Uh, I think HeartMath has done a lot of research on that. You can influence the space you're in, you know, your office, your, your in work environment, just by sending that energy out. And when we start to get a sense of that, it really gives us an understanding of what our now, I hate to use this word because it's a heavy word, but what our responsibility is, it's not only to our own physiology and our own biofield, even though that's just fine. If that's all you want to do, that's fine. But if you want to, you can expand that out and see what you can do in your own environment, what you can do expanding into your neighborhood, into your state, into your country, into the world, and beyond, into the heavens. Yes, to the, yes, to the cosmos. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, beautiful, beautiful thought. Thank you so much, Wendy. Is there anything else that you would like to add to leave our audience with? Well, you know, for everyone, it's a personal exploration of mind-body, you know, mind-body-spirit. And my feeling to everyone is learn, read, check things out, see what resonates for you. Use that intuition just by tr learning to trust it. Uh, let it guide you. Um, enjoy it, have fun with it. A lot of people get very heavy about this. Don't get heavy. My goodness, it's so much fun. <laughs> and and have fun with it and be light about it. That's my recommendation to everyone. Oh, beautiful. Well, Wendy, I, I just love chatting with you. <laughs> 
And Same here. <laughs> thank you. And this has been such an amazing conversation again. And so thank you so much for your time and for your beautiful presence and your beautiful energy. And thank you for your beautiful work. I will include all the links in the show notes so that people can contact you and check out your, your, your website and your workshops and whatever else that you offer. And thank you so very much. I so much appreciate you. Anna, thank you. And right back at you for the work you're doing. It's so important. And I'm just, I treasure, I treasure you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. All the best. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.